I just very quickly want to, we've got some intro slides that kind of set context. I'm sure we all know exactly what we're talking about, but um, for us, it's always useful when we put this out into the world that you understand the context. So we're talking about the landing in next to PNC Park um, within an emerging and kind of bolstering district about entertainment, about recreation, about the role and importance of the river for your city, but also with the sense of pop up and sport and nature and art all kind of converging in one kind of really, really dynamic melting pot on the North Shore. The park today, bounded by the river, obviously, to the north with Isabella Street, Robert, the Roberto Clemente Bridge, and the Warhol Bridge on your uh, right hand side. Um, they, as Gavin said, the, the scope of the park was designed and implemented as one of the US's and certainly Pittsburgh's first kind of sculpture park. Um, and our role is to help you all extrapolate what is the right vision for this place. Um, we've extensively looked at things like the existing condition, the grading. Is it an accessible space to that? How can uh, an individual in a wheelchair use the park? Or frankly, not as the case may be in terms of its access and compliance. What's the status of the vegetation use, this kind of condition? How does the floodplain impact or interact with any of the ideas that we're doing? All that to then kind of continue to do a deep dive in understanding all of the layers, the iterative process and stories that have come from the past, the various ideas that have happened over time, and this kind of sense of critical mass that is starting to develop, uh, largely pushed and motivated through river-like interpretation of these river routes how each part of the Marne and the Allegheny along the riverfront has a unique experience, function, purpose, and a dynamic activation. Our brief by River Life, and, and we submitted a, a request for a proposal to, to participate in this wonderful process, anticipated a fairly small but concise list of kind of needs assessments for the space, provocative thoughts and ideas from our client to test within this project. We were exceptionally blessed to be able to participate in short life, in, in, in short life. and um, of particular fun was the notion of actually asking the kids to take Play-Doh and make their own interpretation of what you see in the park. It was incredibly well uh, attended. We had to recycle the board three or four times because the dots per image were getting completely overrun. And it gave us a huge cross-section in terms of what's the pulse or what are the needs for this park in terms of the community uh, desire. And part of our role is to extrapolate that and to turn it into visions that hopefully are compatible with everyone here's opinion of what that space was going to be. We heard perhaps obvious things, like we love the trees because they have good shape. We also heard, oh, wow, I didn't even know this place existed even though it's been here for over two decades. We, we heard the story of, I love the art. I didn't know the art was here. I love the open. There was some real kind of conflict about how people perceived or even aware of, that the park was a functioning thing within a larger ecosystem of, of the river. The dots that I referred to are now kind of extrapolated into a series of graphic diagrams. The bigger the diagram, the more dots they got. So the notion of Interactive artful play elements, really popular. But the, the notion of nature play and water play, really popular. Um, a connection to the water, really, really popular. Lounge seating, seating at the river, again, also really popular. We asked about what's your experience of art in the park, not about what kind of sculptures would you like. And artful lightning was extremely popular. The notion of lighting the underpasses or the underside of the bridges as you pass under them, making not only safer, but more dynamic, more of a talking point, more memorable. Part. And then, of course, what do you want to do in the park? There was a lot of people saying, I just want to hang out. That's going to happen. Like a place to kind of be and stay a while, not necessarily somewhere just to pass through 
although jogging and cycling is amazing, that perhaps there's a reason or a sense of why you want to try and be in space. Not just day, but also at night. Perhaps with movies or concerts and things that kind of generate more of a buzz. And then, what would you like to see? Are there elements of additional art or artful moments? The notion of do we, what is the definition of a pavilion or a shape structure? How does that get interpreted into a design? And there was a heavy weighting from the community of if we're going to do that, it should be something that also is artful in its own right, as opposed to just kind of plucked out of the catalog and placed into the space. This is my favorite slide in the entire presentation. Uh, I would almost stop here because it's been so fun. Now, these are the actual Play Doh models that the kids made. Uh, names like Caterpillar Tunnel Playground, Rainbow Land, uh, Pirate Park. Uh, what was this? Inspirational chair that says nice things to you. I mean, <laughs> pretty cool stuff. Uh, it really it took up breath away in terms of the creativity of what these kids were imagining on the fly, spontaneously, but it's our in almost every dead on in terms of what the rest of the parents and adults and all the people were saying, but just more potent, more fun, cool, and, and creative, frankly. Um, I just want to kind of blow these things up and say, done. So, but it, it's awesome. Um, so the community added a big list of things in terms of seating, lounging, cultural lighting, et cetera, et cetera. And then we ourselves as designers constantly have this kind of checks and balances of let's not forget the fact that if we're making it more accessible to everyone, to families, to kids, let's address things like restrooms, conveniences. Let's, let's be thoughtful about how we build an ecosystem that is sustainable, not just about green sustainability, but about you and I hanging out in the park for a couple of hours and coffee, having lunch. Where do we go if we need to use the bathroom? Simple amenities like that can make a huge difference. We also want to think that this thing is not just a two-hour experience. It should be maybe an 18-hour experience. You can come at night and feel equally safe or safer, perhaps. The notion of lighting being also then big fun and funky. So we have kind of distilled down the sense of must-have or kind of core tenets of, of what the park should be. It should be playful. It should be well-connected. It's supposed to be sustainable. I already covered that in terms of that's not just about the green thing, but it's about sustainability, social sustainability, and economic sustainability. Yeah. How does it impact the adjacent building? How does it act or react with CMC parks or something? And then it must be active, activated in terms of programming and events so that it has a pulse and a cadence and a daily kind of expectation that you can come here multiple times a week or on a regular basis and, and kind of enjoy the space. So I'm just going to talk keywords on this because we will distribute this overall presentation. But our design thesis, this kind of synergy of everything, was an infusion of art, color, mood, and play to really create meaningful connection within this emerging district, not just the North Shore pop up and TNC, but there's no intersection of Sport, art, and nature, almost, with PMC, with pop art, and then with kind of the upstream sections where it really does kind of naturalize the room. The sense of making it sustainable, but thinking about the infrastructure that we're going to build. Thinking about infrastructure so we can maintain and operate it smarter, but also make it more of a representation, a best of, for the city in terms of what Pittsburgh is becoming as a leader of revitalization and of transformation. And then thinking about how we create that cadence and a place that is for generations to come, not just a flash in the pan and kind of move on to the next idea in a, in a couple of years' time. So we always like to lead off with some images that, that inspire us, that are also a, uh, an abstract of, of the things we've heard. This, this site, Allegheny Landing, was formerly the site of a, a, a cotton mill. Uh, with looms and threads and fabrics and had a rich history of labor and rights, and women's rights and, and children's rights. And it has this very kind of um, extensive both push and pull, good and bad history, but it has a really rich kind of fabric. 
and there is a thread count to this place. So we were really inspired by the image on the left being the original looms and the, the making of cotton and, and, and fabrics and how that could be an abstract that it is taken through the architecture, that it is taken through the place making, taken through our design. We know that and believe passionately that the landscape should be something that is really connected to place, about the role of importance of the river and also of the industry and history, but the role of this kind of cross section of the topography coming up to the North Shore and how we can express that sense of place. That sense of place, because of that topography, we believe firmly we should be not only accessible, but universally accessible. That moving up and down and left and right through this park should be barrier free to it in as many instances as possible, or at least accessible to all in every shape and form. And perhaps if we do that, we can also kind of apply an artful interpretation to how we approach accessibility as well to make it fun and funky, something memorable than just kind of a switchback with handrails in the corner of the park. And maybe we can also think then about the kind of the verticality of the space in a really dynamic way. And that verticality, that sense of topography, we think is a real opportunity for play as well. Play, in our mind, isn't, again, pick something out of the catalog and just kind of place it in, in the park. It's something that is interpretive of this place. About landfall, perhaps. About slide. About the role of water. About the dinosaur slide, frankly. Um, and then about maybe the role of river life and the transformation of the Allegheny and Marne becoming this kind of keener, more sustainable place and how we can express that in a multitude of ways to make it fun to play in for all, not just a uh, little bit. Um, and if we do that right, and, and Bart works his magic, the notion of making the park more sustainable is unseen, but the park becomes highly performative in terms of normal dynamics or better soil for the trees, et cetera, et cetera. And we're just able to bake that in and be really resilient to reduce operation and maintenance, to increase the life of the park, to make it, again, a model of exemplary development, we believe. Um, and that would translate also to the architecture in terms of that sense of being artful, thought-provoking, kind of energizing with how our form is created to promote or extend that story, that thesis that we're creating. So that's a lot to kind of get to the fact that there are now four key tenets of the design. A sense of creating event space uh, for, and that event space needs to be nimble and flexible for a wide ranging of community events. Uh, this isn't the Pepsi Cola kind of, you know, Pavilion. This is something that is much more authentic and organic about the place, about the community. It wants to be playful. And it needs to be play for all ages, so that you and I can roll poly down the hill if we want to. But there are also aspects of, of making it for all ages, all all sections of the community, and potentially combining art into that sense of play. There needs to be open green space, but green space that is mutable and function. And then, of course, that, that story about the acceptance. So just to kind of set the tone, we've done a whole series of studies about space. You may recognize the middle image here is the Landing Hotel and the Theater. That holds about 1,800 people, well, between 800 and 1,800 people. When we overlay that onto the design, what it did for us was kind of set a sense of scale and proportion that allows us to Kind of challenge to make a statement and say, we think the lawn should be X bit, or we think that an amphitheater should be Y bit, a playscape should be this or that, and so on. So we looked at slope conditions and amphitheaters. We looked at play space. So for everyone likes the river step. How does that fit within the park? How does Whiteman Park fit within the park? Let's think about projects that then are close to home for us. A really amazing nature playscape in Austin called Kingsley Common. And they take a lot of space. So we started to realize that this maybe play can't be isolated to one individual place within the park. So we keep adding these layers to, to how the park works. 
And let's go to Shin Nevada. Think that's a great place. Really big lawn. Let's think about the old community park. Or again, a former mall to park space in, in, in Austin. Each one of those can handle 200 people, six and a half thousand people at Shen Plaza to 1,400 people at the old Commons. Like, well, can't do Shen, it's too big, you know, and maybe too, it's the wrong scale. We all start to kind of set the tone for what a manageable space could be. Uh, Fontaine feels a little bit small. And we start to then kind of challenge ourselves in layer upon layer, same with accessibility. As I said today, the park is not accessible from, from high to low. Um, you may see some images here that you recognize. The original Allegheny River from PNC Park's ramp system and then the Alcoa What happens when you overlay those ramps onto this park? Even at a maxed out, handrails on both sides with, with ramps and landings, takes up a lot of real estate, a lot more than there is there today. We're being very thoughtful about how, how accessibility is incorporated into the design. And all, all of that gets us to a series of bubbles. And these are our concepts in the day. No, I'm um, it, it's, uh, with These are just kind of benchmarks for us to say, should we push and pull, and this becomes a framework of allowing us to now mold three concepts. Um, so again, the park today, um, great shade, Mix of species, mix of declining health. The, the hedge creates a real barrier. Amazing art pieces that are, in many cases, iconic and, and incredibly important. A waterfront of epic proportions and view. But there are big issues with complex and uh, how the, the lawn is really used. It's a sloped condition, it doesn't even slope at a consistent angle. The flowers I feel very disconnected from the river, et cetera, et cetera. I think all of these are all things that we heard. So we're going to show three concepts, and, and I'm going to whiz through these extremely fast because they're actually on, on the wall uh, to the right of it. Um, um, at the end of this, what we'd love to do is um, we're going to hand out some sticky notes. Green means I like it. Red means I don't. Yellow means I would hang out in this place. You can put as many green and red on the boards as you like, but one yellow per, per option. So just to kind of think about the spaces that you would be in and as a cyclist, you may be planted to a different experience than someone that just wants to read books, for example. But we want to kind of garner immediate reactions and then put this out into the world and there'll be more time for reactions and interactivity through perhaps online surveys and, and things like that. So the first idea we call bread. And each one of these is a fully rendered plan, but it's a rendered plan and a kit of top. These are concepts and they're not meant to be choose one and go. Maybe that happens, but I really doubt it. And I think what we may find is that there are elements from each one that are going to rise to the top, which will give us the information to come back with a final concept that is your idea extrapolated by us, interpreted, and then kind of brought back and made real. So it's really important for us to get that opinion. So red goes back to that story of the history of the place, that kind of braided element. The, the, the ball of yarn or the loom and kind of pulling the thread out, connecting elements from the Warhol, past the PNC, from upper to lower to the elements of the park. It has a huge potential to become not just a line on the ground, but a, a thing that expresses up, perhaps becomes an inspiration for a pavilion or a playful element. It talks about that kind of sinuous, curvaceous move from high to low, uh, and also introduces elements like murals and kind of playful elements, introduces the sense of light, really kind of engaging with that sense of topography. So I'm going to move from River's Edge to Isabella Street on, on each concept and, and do it in a rather kind of formulaic way. But Thread really, we think, has an opportunity to amplify the sense of openness. First and foremost, in this concept, 
the bulkhead and the bike path remain untouched. The sense of moving from 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 east to west. That was easy. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I thought my eyes were going. I was like, oh, God, so uh, uh, the sense of moving underneath the Clemente Bridge and that kind of chicane, left, right, jiggle that you have to do, and keeping that, keeping the waterfront uh, intact and really untouched. Adding an overlook so that there can be a kind of a more democratic sense that the bikes can move past, the runners can move past, that there's a sense of placement, a great sense of congregation for that sense of view and overlook. It imagines taking the existing terrace, I mean, a float lawn and terracing it like an amphitheater. But what it also then imagines is says that maybe the upper plaza is more of an event hall with a stage up by Isabella Street and really kind of civic scale benches and furnishings. But this is a flat lawn adjacent to an amphitheater down with the two circles being the existing my sculpture. It imagines that from Isabella Street that is perhaps just painted, existing street painted, with an abstract mural that may be the continuation of the mural that's on the Warhol alleyway today. But there is actually the yellow line, that thread starts from that alleyway, perhaps, and goes through the Isabella Street, becomes up and over, becomes a, a pavilion over the stage, drops back down, maybe becomes a bench around the event hall, and is in the paving and down the accessible ramp to another shared structure that may be an impromptu place for acoustic performances, and then over here becomes part of play structure. And a play structure that may be about working with the landform and this kind of almost kind of an e and enemy kind of netting structure that is about organic natural play as opposed to just sit on the swing and go. About interpreting, interpreting that is balanced on this side with a structure with perhaps just more made to play elements around the existing Sugarman teeth that was designed to be interacted with. There are bench elements. It's meant to be sat on and and, and, and touched. It's not necessarily this crack that don't touch me thing. And perhaps there are flies, and that sense of if there's a mural in Isabella Street, maybe that just gets replicated under the bridges as a way to kind of activate those spaces and have a sense of continuity and repetition. There you see perhaps an image of those amphitheatre terraces. The sense of the thread and the yarn and that kind of yellow aspect gold kind of line, the pavement becoming maybe an abstract of a pavilion over the stage. To, and we should have photoshopped this yellow, but uh, the sense of the play structure being something that is wildly different and imaginative, that is part of the landform, the sense of movement. By contrast, the simple flat bent more, that sense of a really nimble, flexible, usable space. Balanced with a sense of an enhanced sense of moment and access and engagement with the river as an, an enlarged overlay. And then maybe just the sense of if there's a place structure, also the notion of nature type and using mirrors, and native plants and logs and strambles and creating a much more dynamic space for exploration, learning, and kind of interactivity as opposed to just static. The second concept we call overlook. And in this instance, uh, again, each one mixes the kind of the pop a little bit and, and shows a different variation in the theme. It's going to challenge the grading much more significantly though, because we have a slope lawn from bike path up to the park have to flatten it, which will naturally create a great separation and another overlook by the my team. Perhaps there's an opportunity to expand the existing wooden boardwalk that's down on the water's edge and make it accessible and connected on both ends of the park. And perhaps, whoops, giving it away, perhaps there are opportunities to actually have a stage and other elements that 
going to create congregation and activation. And in this instance, things starting to introduce that story of light, art lighting as a very thought-provoking kind of aspect that maybe in a plaza, under the bridge, are the ways to kind of create these kind of memorable moments. I'm not trying to create Instagram moments, but it's memorable places that become kind of mapped in your brain and hey, let's meet at that place, or have you seen this, or, you know, it's, it's a photographic moment in your mind. So, again, start from the river. The existing boardwalk is, is extended on, on both ends. Under the Clemente Bridge, maybe it's a new and improved canoe launch, but it's flat and it's at the water's edge. It may have the hammer, so you can lie on this netting a foot above the water. In the shade, in the sun. It's, it's no longer this kind of dead end kind of experience. And perhaps then it ramps back up and connects back to the bike trail so that it can be a greater sense of delineation and separation of users from bike to pedestrian. And if we do that, perhaps we can also divide the path so that there is a de designated bike way and a designated foot path. So there's a greater sense of clarity. And, and I'm guilty of it. First time in the park, standing there, looking like an idiot, almost getting knocked down by a cyclist, just because there is a conflict there. There's an opportunity to resolve. It's dangerous to I imagine so. Dogs, bikes, then really idiotic people. Bad yeah. Um, in this <laughs> in this instance, we're also then imagining that the lawn is flattened, so that the event lawn is actually at the water's edge. And what that allows us to create is an opportunity not only for kind of ceremonial grand staircases and terraces, but plaza spaces where also in this iteration we're imagining that the Sugarman maybe isn't in the right place. But maybe the Sugarman should be relocated into this new plaza space adjacent to the lawn, give it a greater sense of sense of peace and presence in the plaza. So that we might be able to create a nature play experience called River Life that is an abstract around parrot and pitch and the plants of the river. And it's kind of larger than life, and it could be really interactive. Um, it shows some examples of how that can be done. But then the accessibility is done in a much more sculptural way, which is kind of interactive. Interactive with a way to kind of really make the space under the bridge more of a pedestrian realm than a bicycle chicane because the bike lane is brought in front of the buttress of the bridge today with a new small bike bridge extension. So that connects effectively to the alignment with the existing trail. So you just zip, 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 and people are walking, bikes are going, and then you can be under the bridge and you're reducing and removing that conflict of interest. As we come up the stairs to the upper plaza, we're creating, creating this, this edge, what we're calling kind of a bulkhead or an overlay, where the stage and perhaps an object, a pavilion structure that works in balance with this mind sculpture is this kind of moment of revealing the river. I think it's literally kind of a, a, a moment of being an overlook. To guide and kind of have you move down the staircase to the lawn and kind a of greater sense of choreography of space within the design. So the upper plaza can be also an event space, but hard. Increasing the amount of trees, looking at soil volume, but maybe in this context, looking at adding a built kiosk, maybe with a cafe vendor, coffee, ice cream, but maybe also a restaurant so that. If this thing is for kids and families, you and I hanging out for a three hour lunch break, that we can actually, you know, use the restroom. Anyway, get the trip. It's, it's making the space much more useful and, and resilient and interactive. Introducing that notion that maybe the art lighting occurs under the bridge or in, in the edge of the plaza alongside of the office building. Maybe this is an iteration of what river life looks like in the sense of slides and climb and slide the heron and run around the reeds and kind of a sense of interactive space that is custom to the birds, fish of 
the Allegheny River, perhaps. There's the netting. Could be as they all, could be blue, could be black. Uh, but that notion of giving people opportunities to experience the river in a different way, I think, is really exciting. Could be unique opportunity. And in the same vein, the notion of how pavilion and netting and play structures start to kind of have a similar kind of theme and DNA about being iconic moments and elements of the park. Just like the stage, just like the nature flow. So the last concept really kind of looks at the sense of if we've started a dialogue about topography and landform, and we've started to introduce the importance of accessibility, are there other opportunities? Are there ways that we can increase the connectivity of this site within the DNA of not only the river room, but of the sister bridge? And the connection and importance of the bridges to the city, to the North Shore, to the entire kind of fabric of, of everything around it. Can we actually make the playscape for kids larger than life play? Can we adapt those? Build those in? Can we again introduce color as a way to kind of make things more awkward? What about water and playful elements in a, in a plaza space? Is it important to have a second? Fountain more than just the river step, maybe an interactive kind of splash and a plaza feature. Uh, the notion of again moving in the park. And in this sense, rather than just saying, what if we just painted it in our street? Is there a story? Well, it's not part of the park scope, but imagining kind of the greater context. So think about Isabella Street as a kind of a liberated people plaza, a festival street than necessarily a car play. And thinking about how that can be another kind of revitalization tool for not only economic revitalization, but from that sense of then PNC Park and three game post game, court game, you know, car shows and so on and so forth, that it becomes an extension of the park within a district, within the pop up, within the kind of larger context of the district. And how we can really kind of celebrate architecture and definition of edges and grade in really profound way. So this this concept represents I think, some of the kind of the some would say boldest ideas, some would say almost kind of wacky ideas. I think wacky is, is a good thing in this conversation. For now, um, it asks the question of whether the bulkhead, that uh, eight foot retaining wall of the river, is the right move, and whether actually Engaging with and being able to step down to the river is a more energizing, dynamic thing. Uh, it's certainly a challenging thing to execute, but is it the right move? Is it also the right move to actually create an entirely new kind of bike path that is entirely separate from the pedestrian movement along this quadrant? And I talked about the importance of the bridges. We talked about the importance of topography. And here what we imagine is, is kind of two, two gestures. If we're standing at the entrance to the park from the Clemente Bridge, there's an opportunity to move down a ramped condition that could actually have mounds and hillocks and little tunnels and kind of crawl spaces so that it's no longer an acceptable ramp. It's part of the play structure running up and down the ramp going through the tunnel climbing over the little mound, and it becomes a kind of a, a facet of play. It moves you vertically down from the Clemente Bridge to the river, down a series of steps to maybe a constructed wetland or a shallow area of the water. And if that move makes sense of, of moving down to the river, what if we actually address the notion of the plaza and could we imagine moving up to the Warhol Bridge and kind of bring the sense of almost kind of three or four dimensional play of coming from the Warhol Bridge down a boardwalk through the trees to the park at less than 4%, just because of the, the elevation of the plaza and the bridge today, versus going from the Clemente Bridge down to the park 
And then that kind of sense of encouraging people to kind of transect left and right as we now move on this almost travelator across the space. And at the same time, still have direct path, walkways and steps, maybe an amphitheater that comes with Bramble area, portion of the lawn that could be literally the roly poly hill, just a graded condition next to the scrambles depth and a staircase. And I think if this notion of the, the aerial promenade or walkway makes sense, it's then also 12 to 14 feet above you, the legs of that thing could become a part of play structure. The underside of that element could become part of the, the reflectiveness of the artful nature of this space within this sense of crazy kids, octopuses and caterpillars and other things that they created within the sense of playscape. So deliberately making something that is infrastructure, art, play, and art kind of art at the same time. So there's this kind of constant purposeful kind of mooshing together. It's a very technical term in terms of bringing things and giving them a duality or you know, a, 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 a multiplicity of, of function. So we have the platform, we have the engaged river steps, the roly poly, the scramble, the terracing, the ability to engage this plaza. But in this concept, we said that the upper plaza should maybe do three things. What if we actually added the fountain jets, color, light, maybe fog, make this this highly interactive, kid friendly, and big kid friendly kind of water play activity. So we know how popular the water steps are, but allow us to be more durable than that and more flexible where at a moment, a flip of the switch, literally Gavin, you know, we've got an event setting up tonight, turn off the fountain, set up the tent. Become that flexible and durable in the winter time, turn them off, decommission them, you know, shut them down so they don't kind of deteriorate. In this instance, it then asks the question, you know, should there be access to a cafe and restaurant? Are they a kiosk in the plaza or are they a conversation about being part of or adjacent to in part of an adjacent area? And if all of that makes sense, if we're doing this kind of notion of the play in the elevated walkway, we thought that a really remarkable idea of suggesting maybe that the Sugarman becomes the gateway moment again. And I truly think that it was meant to be a gateway gesture which was placed in that corner. Things are just kind of overgrown around it and it kind of feels discombobulated in that corner today. Bringing it up into the plaza, making it again a, a part of the branding and wayfinding of this plaza, of Isabella Street, that now in this iteration may have removable bollocks on either end, that it may be paved and be the same elevation as the plaza itself and become an extension of the plaza. It becomes your festival street for maybe PNC, maybe for the Warhol, maybe for Riverlife, maybe for the city, everything. But it becomes a kind of radical interpretation of does it really need to be a place to pass the day? Absolutely still, well, it still needs to be a place for emergency vehicles and life safety. But do we need to have places just to parallel park? And could it actually be a really remarkable place to have that farm market or chalk fence? And again, that liberates the space for you, the people. So maybe just as we talked about the underside of the, the area of walkway, maybe the underside of the bridge is also this kind of remarkable abstract, something awful. It may just be reflected. No wonder it's mirrored or it has lights and hanging things and really kind of cool. The notion of actually stepping down and sitting at the water's edge is a very rare condition along most of the urban portion of, of this section of the river. The sense of play. I'm going to be in that band. Don't know about the little one, but that sense of bringing that kind of dynamism into a club space and then having it be colorful at night, maybe having fog, making it this kind of choreography of events. And as I said, and, and some of the wicked ideas that Christy and the team have had about. So if we have this walkway, it's a buzz. Let's really think about the underside of this thing as something that is awful. 
that may be reflective. May the, the poles and legs of this thing that are holding it up become part of the play structure that you can climb between or around. And then let's again just think about the vibrancy of the built environment, the public realm, and what his developer could be on a much more frequent basis, perhaps, with the plot, and how that interacts with movie time on the lawn, or a, or a performance, or the fireworks, or, or, or. All to get the re idea that we've had a huge amount of fun listening, digesting, absorbing, and coming to you today, I hope, with some ideas you didn't imagine. And maybe there are, hopefully, I think there are some things that you say, I thought of that. He wrote it down, put a sticky touch on that to ask me to. But we would love to elicit feedback. We would love to elicit a sense of take, a, take the little dot and study these plans a little bit more. Um, absolutely open to any questions that you may have. Um, I think we're still figuring out the exact format of how this lives on the website or in the survey format because there's a lot of information, a lot of ideas. And, but we're at a point where the next step for us is to listen intently, to garner as much feedback from our clients, from the city, from you, the public, and then come back in what will feel like a couple of weeks with, with renders and plans of a recommended concept. One, perhaps one final plan or a hybrid of, of the plan into an iteration where Savino will help us kind of realize a sense of crisis and art will help us to realize a sense of logistics and commenting and make this thing as real as possible so that we can talk about potential next steps. So perhaps potentially facing, potentially a reality around how do we pull this off? Is this the right way? So um, thank you for intensely listening. Uh, I know there's a lot to say and uh, I'm all ears.